You're listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Berkman. Our guest today is Roger Smith. He's the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania and the immediate past president of the American Political Science Association. His new book is called That Is Not Who We Are, Populism and Peoplehood. Roger Smith, welcome to the podcast. Great to see you, Matt. Your new book is a response to the rise of what you call pathological populisms uh, across the world and in the U.S., Um, And this is something that many political scientists have been writing about recently. Uh, You even frame the book as an attempt to improve upon this existing crisis of democracy literature. So I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what that literature gets right on your view, what it gets wrong, uh, and how your book offers a corrective. The literature is certainly right to say that there are authoritarian nationalist movements around the world uh, that are seeking power and in some places are in power, uh, and that there are threats to democracy and the rule of law in many locations. The literature labels all these movements as populist and uses definitions of populism that build into them the notion uh, that populists claim to speak for a virtuous, homogenous people uh, against an evil, corrupt elite, and that populist leaders, uh, believing uh, this account to be true, feel entitled, once they're in power, uh, to uh, restructure constitutional democratic institutions Um, into vehicles for their own will without any kinds of checks and balances. I think that there are some authoritarian nationalists uh, that meet this description. I object to calling every movement that um, uses the label populist or claims to be the People's Party as such authoritarian nationalists most scholars of populism have recognized that there are left nationalisms and uh, or left populisms and right populisms, uh, but uh, many are not willing to concede that many movements, uh, which are motivated by uh, angers at elites that anger at elites that are based often in legitimate grievances, um, uh, may claim the title of populism, but may not be so fundamentally opposed to democracy and the rule of law. Uh, I worry that by calling movements populist and saying that means that they're fundamentally anti-democratic, that we're undercutting attention uh, to the grievances against economic and political elites uh, that have some foundation. Um, And so therefore we end up Um, protecting elite abuses uh, that do deserve to be challenged. You also kind of critique the existing literature for not providing insight into how we might uh, construct counter narratives to contest uh, pathological populists, as you call them. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, one uh, central argument is uh, that the accounts of populism um, often don't pay much serious attention to the accounts of the people uh, that different kinds of populist or nationalist movements uh, put forth uh, because they're being defined in ways that um, make their conceptions of the people inherently illegitimate. There's not a lot of attention uh, to who they're actually saying the people are. Um, And as a result, uh, I think that uh, they actually diminish our capacities uh, to combat pathological forms of populism uh, because uh, by not um, elaborating uh, the accounts of the people put forth by these pathological forms of populism, uh, they also neglect the need to counter the appeal of pathological forms of populism uh, with narratives of shared political identity uh, that don't legitimate uh, the uh, authoritarian and undemocratic abuses of 
uh, certain kinds of populist conceptions. Uh, so I argue that if you are concerned about the pathological forms of populism, uh, you need to look at their notions of the people and counter them with more appealing notions of the people, accounts that are more uh, egalitarian and inclusive. And in your book, you offer three criteria uh, that you say are important for constructing uh, non-pathological stories of national identity. One, uh, the stories must be resonant with people. Two, they must be respectful. And three, they must be what you call reticulated. Um, so I'm wondering, can you say more specifically what you mean uh, by those three criteria? Pathological populists, authoritarian nationalists, offer accounts of the people that work politically because they resonate uh, with uh, the pre-existing senses of personal identity and of uh, uh, collective identity that uh, people possess, as well as their senses of their interests, their grievances uh, about economic, cultural, political developments. And if they are to be countered effectively, uh, then you need narratives of collective political identity, stories of peoplehood that also resonate uh, in the sense uh, that they draw on and speak to uh, people's pre-existing senses of their identities and interests. You need to talk to Americans as Americans. You need to talk to Danes as Danes, uh, drawing on what those identities uh, have meant to them uh, historically, but because all communities have multiple elements in their collective identities, you can draw on those elements uh, that point in more inclusive and egalitarian directions uh, while uh, disavowing those aspects of their uh, history and identity uh, that uh, work toward um, uh, exclusion uh, and injustices of many types. So uh, resonance is politically necessary. I argue also uh, that um, uh, resonance is uh, respectful. It shows respect to people's um, uh, uh, status uh, as people with um, uh, uh, values and concerns that deserve uh, to be respected. Um, and I think that any defensible kind of uh, uh, sense of political community today um, needs to build on the many uh, human traditions that argue that all human beings deserve respect. Um, so uh, you will need to draw in a particular context on those uh, traditions calling for respect for all people uh, that resonate uh, with that particular community and population. Um, uh, but uh, that's always possible to do in the, the modern world. There are many traditions that call for respect for human beings. Uh, and if a story of peoplehood uh, expresses respect for human beings, it's less likely to be prey uh, to the kind of intolerance um, and uh, undemocratic features that pathological forms of populism have. Uh, the third element I call um, for is uh, reticulated stories of peoplehood, and this gives people pause because it's an unfamiliar word, but I use it uh, because I think we need a new term uh, for uh, an old goal, uh, which is uh, to um, pursue political equality uh, to pursue forms of community uh, in which people are uh, have equal status as members of that community, equal citizenship, uh, if you will. And uh, for a long time, we've equated equal citizenship with uniform citizenship, uh, with all persons having identical bundles of rights and duties. At least that's been the rhetorical uh, meaning of equal citizenship. In practice, we've often recognized that uh, political status can't be meaningfully equal if we treat everybody identically uh, because human beings aren't identical. 
Uh, they have different circumstances, different needs, different aspirations. And uh, really, if you're pursuing equal citizenship, uh, you need to um, uh, provide uh, policies and institutions uh, that uh, give people roughly equal opportunities uh, to pursue their distinct aspirations and ways of life. Uh, and so uh, we need a notion of um, uh, equal community membership uh, that flags not uniformity, uh, but appropriately, appropriately egalitarian forms of difference. Um, and I use reticulated for this um, uh, less familiar concept of equal uh, political membership, equal standing uh, in a political people. And that's what I say stories of peoplehood should strive for. Uh, they should resonate with people's senses of who they are, but they should express respect for all human beings. And that respect means that they should be um, reticulated, uh, giving members of the community um, uh, equal opportunities, uh, but that means uh, policies uh, that recognize and accommodate uh, the differences in their needs and aspirations. So your book offers a number of examples of non-pathological stories of peoplehood from uh, different countries around the world. In the U.S. context, uh, you propose several themes that you say could serve as a basis for a, a more pluralistic national story. Um, and these themes include, uh, one, the country's commitment to democracy in general. Uh, you also mentioned the theme of uh, e pluribus unum, unity out of diversity, uh, which is a theme that you say former President Obama often built his rhetoric around. And finally, you talk about the theme of extending the rights enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, uh, which is the theme that you say you most prefer. So from the perspective of your three criteria of good stories, could you tell us why you prefer uh, an, an American national story rooted in the Declaration of Independence? Yes, uh, Barack Obama, uh, throughout his career, built on uh, the uh, promise in the Constitution that we would seek to build a more perfect union, and he combined that uh, with the uh, motto on the seal of the United States, e pluribus unum, out of many one, uh, to argue uh, that the um, American political project, the American constitutional project, is a quest to uh, try to build a more perfect union by um, uh, finding common ground without effacing our many forms of diversity. Uh, and I think that's a commendable uh, vision of peoplehood that resonates with things uh, that um, many Americans have long valued, uh, that expresses uh, respect and concern for all, and uh, that does point in the direction of achieving union without um, uh, treating people identically. Instead, uh, showing respect for differences is bound up in that e pluribus unum uh, goal. But it suffered from the deficiency that Obama had a hard time defining uh, what those uh, matters of common ground, what those shared goals of um, the American political project should be. Uh, he identified his e pluribus unum vision of American peoplehood uh, with a kind of uh, deliberative democracy uh, that thinkers often building on American democratic pragmatist traditions have emphasized. And it's one uh, in which you don't insist that there are any specific shared goals. You understand the Pluribus Unum project as one of um, uh, allowing everybody a voice and through uh, deliberation and discussion, you identify what those areas of common ground are uh, and what matters uh, you allow people to um, uh, pursue in very distinctive ways. Uh, and uh, you form your agenda through a kind of deliberative democratic process. That's a great ideal, uh, but um, it doesn't provide a very concrete sense of common purposes. Um, it explicitly disavows doing that. Uh, and in practice, uh, Obama encountered um, uh, 
obstinate opposition that was not willing to participate in good faith deliberation to find common ground. Um, Mitch McConnell said uh, when Obama was elected that his goal was to make him a one-term president. He didn't succeed in doing that, but he did succeed in simply blocking um, most of the kinds of initiatives that Obama uh, supported um, after uh, the Democrats lost control of Congress in 2010. Um, and uh, just refused to engage in the kind of deliberative democratic process that was at the heart of the uh, Obama uh, vision of how you achieved e pluribus unum. So I've argued uh, that um, there are uh, comparative advantages instead uh, in building primarily on uh, the vision of the United States as a political project rooted in the Declaration of Independence, uh, which says that the purposes of government are to secure for all um, certain fundamental rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, I believe that last uh, implies that we have to recognize that people's pursuits of happiness differ, and so we have to accommodate a variety of ways of life uh, within the American uh, political project. Um, it is a uh, vision that um, provides uh, more in the way of concrete goals. We have to ask ourselves, do our current institutions and policies create conditions in which people uh, have uh, uh, reasonably secure possession of meaningful opportunities for life, liberty, and the uh, pursuit of happiness um, as they understand it. Uh, do they have the material resources? Do they have uh, the legal and political social opportunities uh, in order uh, to enjoy these rights securely? Uh, that gives you uh, more of a concrete sense of purpose of what you're trying to accomplish in politics. Um, and I think that, uh, therefore, um, it uh, can work better to build a broad coalition uh, in favor of uh, a vision of shared peoplehood uh, that is inclusive, that is egalitarian, um, uh, but that also does resonate with what Americans care about, um, uh, that uh, is a call for respect for all and uh, does uh, uh, urge accommodation of um, appropriately different ways of life. Now, I realize it's hard to think back all the way to 2016, given all that's going on in the world right now. But I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, Trump defeated Hillary Clinton in 2016, at least in terms of the Electoral College. Um, so at the time, did you have an assessment of the story that Clinton was telling Americans, uh, and if so, how did you evaluate that story? I did have an assessment, and I thought it was a uh, deficient story. Uh, I thought that she told the story of her campaign as one in which she would further the American project uh, by um, uh, electing a woman a president as president for the first time. You know, her slogan was, I'm with her. And she promised to um, uh, crack the glass ceiling. Um, she promised uh, to bring uh, the strengths of um, an experienced, tough, smart woman to political leadership. Uh, but that was a story of the American project that basically said, well, we haven't had a woman as president, and um, this is a very good one. Um, uh, the way to carry the project forward um, uh, is to be with her. Uh, that's a story that doesn't speak very powerfully uh, to uh, the senses of um, grievance, the senses of frustration uh, that many Americans were experiencing. Um, Trump spoke to those senses of grievance and frustration uh, much more effectively uh, when he said uh, that um, uh, globalist self-serving elites had been designing national um, economic uh, and social policies in ways uh, that advanced their interests, uh, but worked against the interests of uh, uh, millions of others, Americans. 
Um, and uh, Donald Trump uh, stoked the flames of grievance by um, insisting that immigration policies were bringing uh, dangerous foreigners to the country, uh, that um, uh, free trade policies uh, were benefiting the rich at the expense of uh, the great mass of Americans. Um, uh, and uh, he promised to be their champion. He said, she says, um, you should be with her. I say, I'm with you. And that was a story of American peoplehood summed up in the slogans of America first and make America great again uh, that um, uh, did resonate much more powerfully uh, with the concerns of millions of Americans. Uh, his story pointed to uh, policies that I think did not uh, benefit uh, those who rallied to his cause, but he had a compelling story and Hillary Clinton did not. And how is Joe Biden doing? I think Joe Biden is starting off doing much better. Uh, he is um, adapting uh, the Obama e pluribus story uh, by stressing, as he did in a speech in Philadelphia on June 3rd, uh, that America has an imperfect union, uh, but the collective task is to make it more perfect. And we make it uh, more perfect uh, by including in the benefits of American life uh, those uh, who have been left out despite having made uh, uh, many contributions, and he argues powerfully uh, that recent policies uh, have uh, benefited the wealthiest Americans um, at the uh, expense of uh, uh, middle-class Americans, working Americans, and especially um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities in the United States uh, who faced a past and present uh, history of uh, discrimination and disadvantage. So he says, um, it's always been a struggle uh, for the soul of America. Are we going to live up to our highest ideals? Are we uh, uh, instead uh, going uh, to give in to the demons of uh, racism and economic greed? And that is an account which both builds on the deeply resonant uh, view that we're a people seeking to create a more perfect union, uh, as Obama did. Uh, uh, but uh, now he is um, articulating that vision um, in terms of uh, a policy agenda uh, aimed at uh, the imperfections he identifies um, and trying to uh, lay out how we can do better. Uh, he's followed up that speech with a series of major policy speeches in which um, uh, he tries to spell out the implications of this story of American peoplehood in concrete policies. Um, and anytime you do that, uh, there are going to be people who criticize the policies you advance. So far, it seems to me he's doing a reasonable job of uh, offering policies uh, that move in a more progressive direction than he traditionally has uh, supported, uh, while still at the same time uh, being policies with which um, uh, the great mass of Americans can identify. In your discussion of populism, uh, you note the existence of uh, other forms of populism that are not illiberal and xenophobic, um, but that do set up an opposition between the people uh, and a corrupt elite. Um, for example, Senator Bernie Sanders, who I, I believe was mentioned only once in your book, he offered Americans a version of the populist story that was uh, egalitarian in terms of race, gender, sexuality, etc., um, and that was directed not against stigmatized outsiders, but against powerful economic interests and elites. Um, and, you know, although he didn't win the primary, uh, polling did suggest that Sanders was uh, more nationally popular than uh, any other candidate. So, you know, my question to you is, does your requirement that a story be respectful uh, preclude a combative stance towards towards elites? Um, you make the strong case that American peoplehood stories should foster this substantive in-group identity. Uh, but what about the political utility or the role of righteous anger against an out-group? 
Is there is there a role for that? I think there's not only room for it, it's mandatory. Uh, if you have a group uh, whose uh, policies and influence are working against uh, the realization of the appropriate goals of a political community, um, uh, they should be attacked and they should be taken from power. Um, and I think Bernie Sanders did a terrific job of telling a uh, compelling story of um, the way that um, American elites uh, had too often uh, pursued their own interest instead of the common interest. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, he did better than I thought uh, an American political leader could do uh, by using the language of democratic socialism as an image of American peoplehood. I don't regard democratic socialism as an illegitimate conception of common political identity uh, at all. Uh, but I did question uh, how well it could resonate uh, with the American people. It clearly resonates with um, uh, many in uh, uh some Northern European countries. Uh, I doubted it could work here. Um, it worked much better than I expected because I think uh, Bernie Sanders uh, was identifying um, real and legitimate uh, grievances against uh, elite policies uh, that had worked against the interests of uh, many Americans. Uh, and I think Joe Biden uh, has learned a lesson from that. Um, he is moving to the left partly because uh, Bernie Sanders was so successful. And I think that um, as a result, um, if Biden wins and if he wins uh, by a large uh, majority, uh, no means certain, but it is possible, uh, he will be in a position uh, to be the most progressive American president since FDR. I think that he um, uh, wants now uh, to be that uh, kind of progressive president with a much greater emphasis on racial uh, justice than FDR had. Um, and it's possible that if he does that, uh, then as the American um, political project goes forward, the American people will uh, more readily embrace um, uh, uh, progressive visions of their identity of the sort that Bernie Sanders uh, advanced. Uh, he didn't uh, win this time, uh, but I do think um, uh, the process of defining ourselves as a people is always a matter of ongoing contestation, and he pushed that contestation um, in a new direction. Now that we've uh, established your socialist bona fides, I wanted to ask you about a part of your book that might be a little bit more controversial on the left. Um, in your call for uh, what you call reticulated stories of peoplehood, you suggest uh, that just as we should respect and accommodate differences of gender, sexuality, age, ability, etc., you say so too should we take reasonable steps to accommodate the views of religious and cultural conservatives. Uh, at least when uh, doing so would not cause greater harm to other people. Uh, and you mentioned the Masterpiece Cake Shop case that went before the Supreme Court uh, a little while ago where a fundamentalist Christian baker refused to design a cake for a gay couple. Um, in that case, the, the court actually sided with the baker, though they did so on fairly narrow uh, grounds. Um, but my question is, what have you observed in American society that led you to kind of foreground this discussion of uh, the cake shop case and to stress the need to further accommodate uh, religious conservatives? Uh, well, first, let me say uh, that um, uh, I'm not a socialist. I wasn't establishing my socialist bona fides. I was um, just joking. Uh, I am a kind of uh, left Keynesian capitalist, if you will. Uh, but um, uh, my point about Bernie Sanders uh, was that um, uh, his success did make this kind of story of peoplehood a more viable contender than it's ever been before. Um, and uh, uh, that, I think, is, from my normative point of view, uh, very valuable. 
uh, since the country has been going to the right. During the Trump administration and on a lot of economic issues, it's been going to the right uh, uh, for much longer. Um, uh, I share the view uh, that the Clinton and the Obama administrations uh, embraced neoliberal policies um, on many economic issues uh, that ultimately contributed to um, the uh, massive inequality that we have today uh, and a lack of meaningful opportunities uh, for uh, too many Americans. Um, that same kind of perspective leads me uh, to focus on whether we have policies and institutions that do give people uh, uh, the material resources and opportunities uh, to pursue their preferred ways of life. I think that um, if you uh, are going to have uh, a story of peoplehood uh, that is uh, respectful of diverse ways of life, um, you cannot uh, say that um, uh, people who hold traditionalist religious beliefs are simply beyond the pale. I think that Politically, um, it's a counterproductive strategy, and I'll acknowledge that um, uh, the tremendous evangelical support uh, for Donald Trump, a truly evil man, um, did uh, persuade me that um, a lot of liberal policies um, have been pursued uh, with a rhetoric and substance uh, that have uh, profoundly alienated uh, traditionalist religious Americans uh, uh, so that they're doing something uh, that they never thought in their wildest dreams they would do, uh, supporting uh, a man like Donald Trump. And I do want um, uh, to pull those people back into a shared sense of the uh, American uh, political project and political community, uh, if possible, by treating them respectfully. At the same time, um, if they are pursuing uh, forms of conduct uh, that deny uh, legitimate opportunities and resources to pursue those opportunities uh, for uh, people that have uh, uh, ways of life they don't approve, uh, then you've got a situation in which you've got um, uh, clashing conceptions of pursuits of happiness um, and uh, you try to, I think, accommodate each of them as far as you can, uh, but at some point you have to make a choice in public policies. Um, uh, one side or the other isn't going to get their way. Uh, in regard to the Masterpiece Cake issue, um, uh, the view I've taken there is quite controversial uh, in uh, uh, with a lot of people uh, whose views I uh, greatly respect and value. Um, uh, my argument uh, has been that if it is the case that um, uh, denials of uh, service to same-sex couples uh, for uh, things like a designer wedding cake are so limited that they have abundant material opportunities uh, and legal rights uh, to um, get married and have a great wedding cake. Um, if uh, the uh, accommodation uh, doesn't deny them material opportunities, and if the accommodation doesn't work as a precedent for other policies that would deny them material opportunities uh, to pursue their preferred way of life, uh, then maybe we can risk that accommodation. Uh, maybe it is a way of uh, allowing traditionalist religious believers uh, to feel uh, that uh, they can pursue their preferred way of life um, while still participating uh, in the uh, common economic institutions and civil institutions of our uh, society. Uh, but I think I've always been clear, um, if uh, those traditionalist religious beliefs operate as they have so often in the past, uh, to provide real denials of material opportunities um, to get married, to see a loved one who's sick in a hospital, uh, to get a job, 
uh, then those kinds of religious accommodations go too far. Uh, but I do think that uh, a spirit of trying to have egalitarian, inclusive forms of peoplehood means that you have to give consideration about um, uh, whether you can provide uh, some accommodations to traditional religious believers instead of um, trying to uh, expel them, uh, in effect, from the civic community. Uh, that means uh, that uh, they're going to seize on any champion they can uh, to try to defeat you. Um, and I'm afraid that's what's happened. Roger Smith, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, well, thank you so much, Matt. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. <laughs>